heaven, a place, a city, a home, by Ian Bounds. Chapter 14. Heaven, a home. Heaven is called a kingdom for its immense greatness, and a city because of its great beauty and population. It is full of inhabitants of all nations, where are many angels, and infinite number of the just, even as many as have died since the death of Abel. And thither shall repair all such as shall die in Christ in the end of the world. And after the general judgment shall there remain forever, invested in their glorious bodies. How happy will it be to live with such persons. Jeremy Taylor The Epistle to the Hebrews, 11th chapter, speaking of the Old Testament saints, says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. The Revised Version changes this so that it reads, For they that say such things make it manifest that they are seeking after a country of their own. Dean Alford, in his commentary, translates it thus, that they seek after a home. The English word country does not give the, strong, uh, the idea strong enough. The word is defined, one's native country, one's fatherland, one's own country. Heaven is our home, our fatherland. Here we are, foreigners, pilgrims, and strangers. The heart of a stranger, the loneliness and longings of a stranger, the efforts and weariness of the pilgrims should be ours. The heart sign, the exiled yearnings, should declare to all plainly that we are not at home, that we are not native to these skies, but heaven-born, seeking the heavenly country. Heaven ought to draw and engage us. Heaven ought to so fill our hearts and hands, our manner and our conversation, our character and our features, that all would see that we are foreigners, strangers in this world, natives of a nobler clime fairer than this. Out of tune, out of harmony, out of course, we must be with this world. The very atmosphere of the world should be chilling to us and noxious. Its sun's eclipse and its companionship dull and insipid. Heaven is our native land and home to us, and death to us is not the dying hour, but the birth hour. Heaven should kindle desire, and like a magnet draw us upward to the skies. Duty, in, ex in ex exonable duty, fealty to God alone should hold us there. A beautiful, gifted young woman once said, that she had not seen one minute for several years wherein she desired to live one moment longer for the sake of any other good in her life but doing good, living to God, and doing what might be to his glory. Paul was brought into a strait between desire and duty. Christ in heaven had his heart, but duty kept him in exile. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And for I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall cho choose, I want not. For I am in strait between two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. With Paul it was as it ever should be. Duty retires desire and teaches it to wait till the glad hour of its flirtation. Of those ancient believers spoken of in Hebrews 11, we discover that they are, well, all were pilgrims and strangers on the earth, and heavenly longings and heavenly seekings. Alas, for the heart which are settled here, heaven to them is a strange and alien, a far-off land, a background these had. They had left the earth land and refused to go back to it, they had transferred their home and their homeland to the better and heavenly country. God noted their fidelity, heard their signs, and noted their seeking. He was not ashamed of them and built for them a city. It is God built that assures its location, its glory, its eternity, and its bliss. In writing to the Corinthians of the Christian attitude in heaven, Paul says, as we have it in the Revised Version, 
we are willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Here we have one of the strongest, sweetest, most attractive symbols of heaven. Whatever there is in that place we call home, sacred, dear, restful, delightful, full of holy feelings and deathless ties, all these are predicted in a form ten thousand-fold stronger and sweeter of heaven. At home in heaven, what welcome, what satisfaction, what rest to tired feet and tired hearts, what a sense of security and confidence, the home feelings and full opulence of richest wealth. Nowhere on earth's green, glad soil will the home feeling be so profound, so satisfying, so restful, and so happifying as in heaven. It is not only to be realized as home when we get there, but all along the way the home feeling is to draw and bind us to that heavenly world. The homesickness for heaven is to alienate us from earth, make us sick at heart, and beget pinnings for home. With deep spiritual insight and the soundest spiritual philosophy did one of Scotland's most gifted and saintly preachers say after visiting a beautiful mansion. This mansion is altogether too sweet. Other men could hardly live there without saying, This is my rest. I don't think ministers' mansions should ever be so beautiful. This is not overdrawn, but the assertion of a great principle to guard against a great pearl. Great earthly attachments lessen heaven's attachments. The heart which indulges itself in great earthly love will have less for heaven. God's great work, and often his most afflictive and chastising work, is to unfasten our hearts from earth and fasten them to heaven, to break up and desolate the earthly home, that we may seek a home in heaven. My heavenly home is bright and fair. Nor pain nor death can enter there. Its glistering towers the sun outshine. That heavenly mansion shall be mine. Let others seek a home below, which flames devour or waves overflow. Be mine the happier lot to own, a heavenly mansion near the throne. William Hunter <laughs>